Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a great series on the Book of Acts. This particular lesson is lesson number four in that series for July, of tw July 28 of 2018, entitled, The First Church Leaders. I wonder who that would be. Well, we ask that you have your Bibles handy, hope you do already, and that you will follow us as we, and you will join us as we pray together. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these lessons and for the scriptures that challenge us to think about the most important issues in spreading the gospel and how we can help to finish it in our day. May we be up to that challenge as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we know, I don't, this is not news to anyone. When God's work is moving forward vigorously and making progress, who's going to jump in and try to mess things up? Satan. That would be Satan. And what evidence do we have that God's work is moving forward with great progress? Well, there's a couple of very interesting passages we don't talk about very much. The first one's found in Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Okay, team, who were the priests in, that, in those days? Sadducees. Sadducees. They were primarily, if not exclusively, Sadducees. These were the people who, weren't, who were supposed to be adamantly opposed to everything that Christianity taught. And what are they doing? They're joining the Christians. And then look at Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers, these would be the Christians now, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So it sounds like some of them were still, still Pharisees, doesn't it? <laughs> well, so what does this tell us? It tells us that the, the message was making inroads, really significant inroads. Well, uh, many of the new converts that joined the church in those days were over the next three and a half years. Remember, there's three and a half years from the time that Jesus is crucified to the stoning of Stephen, which is coming up. And many of the Jews who joined um, the Christian group during those three and a half years were Hellenistic Jews. What's a Hellenistic Jew? Greek. Greek Jew. These were Jews whose primary language was Greek, largely because they had been raised, born and raised, outside of Galilee, outside of Judea, outside of Palestine. Many of them were then living in or around Jerusalem. So there was a significant difference. Here's, these are the primarily Greek-speaking Christians, now we're talking about, and these are the primarily Aramaic-speaking, or some of them probably maybe could speak Hebrew but primarily Aramaic-speaking Christians. Now, we, just a, a note there, Hebrew, the Hebrew of the Old Testament, by this time was basically a dead language. Only the scholars, the biblical scholars, could actually read Hebrew. Now, Hebrew and Aramaic are not very much different, but the language that the children of Israel came back with from Babylonian captivity was the language of Aramaic. They were forced to speak Aramaic over there, and when they came home, they just kept speaking Aramaic. So Jesus and his friends grew up speaking the language of Babylon, Aramaic, so not, they, not Hebrew. When he got up to read in the, temp, uh, in, in the synagogue and he read from the scroll of Isaiah, would that, that have... That was Hebrew. That was he, it would have been Hebrew, not yep. uh, Greek. Not, not Aramaic or Greek. Yeah. No. So how did the people understand it? <laughs> well... Because what they would do is they would read it, it, and they would sit down, probably translate it at the same point, and then sit down and explain it. That's what he did. Yeah. So why do you suppose, what reasons would a Jew, having been born and raised outside of Judea, outside of Palestine, want to come back and live at Jerusalem? Partake of the, you know, they probably they didn't move out there themselves, their parents did or their ancestors, and 
Quite possibly. And the idea of coming back and participating in the festivals and various okay. things might have appealed to them. Do you think uh, do you think people would be able to survive in, in Galilee or Judea in those days without speaking Aramaic? I yeah. think they were probably a lot of them bilingual. Yeah. yeah, very likely. Yeah, because I mean, if you had to deal with the with the Roman officials, you'd have to speak Greek. And if you went to the marketplace and wanted to buy something, often you had to speak Greek there. So it's very likely that Jesus spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and possibly Latin. Yeah. Because the city of Sepphoris, close to Nazareth, was a, a new building up a, a, a new uh, so Roman probably. city. Yeah. And those would be primarily Latin-speaking people. And that's where they needed carpenters, huh? Yeah. Right. So to be a tradesman, you had to be able to communicate with whoever needed the work. So now let me ask you a question. Can you think of someone who grew up outside of Palestine who came back to Palestine for some reason or another? Oh. The obvious example is Paul, isn't it? And why did he come back to Jerusalem? He's a member of the Sanhedrin. To be well, but education. he didn't come to be a member no. of the Sanhedrin. Yeah, higher education Gamaliel. with Gamaliel. Yeah, he came to get his education. As, as you know, his parents no doubt thought this was the best education in the world. Send our son there. Give him the best education possible. And we know that uh, he ended up being a member of the Sanhedrin. So he had some things to say about that later. Uh, Kerry? This is Acts 26, 9 through 11. I myself thought that I should do everything I could against the cause of Jesus of Nazareth. That is what I did in Jerusalem. I received authority from the chief priests and put many of God's people in prison. And when they were sentenced to death, I also voted against them. I'm going to interrupt you there for just a second. What does it mean to say I voted against them? Death sentence. Okay, that's correct. Who got to vote? Only the top echelon. Only the Sanhedrin. They were the people who did, made those kind of decisions. So this is one of, our mo one of our most compelling reasons for saying we know for sure that Paul... Now, Ellen White speaks of that very plainly, but it's not... I mean, we, we pick few spots like this to tell us from, from Scripture that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. Okay, go ahead. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues and tried to make them deny their faith. I was so furious with them that I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. That's from the American Bible Society, 1992, the Holy Bible, Good News Translation. Puts it pretty bluntly. Mm -hmm. He did not have a God of love, did he? No. <laughs> Paul had a sister who was no doubt raised in Tarsus as Paul was. And where's Tarsus? Turkey. Yeah. In southern south, Turkey south. today, is an area in, that, in those days was called Cilicia, okay, in the south, south central part of, of Turkey today. When Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, now we're, we're jumping way ahead just to, to illustrate the point here about people coming back to Jerusalem. When Paul was arrested in Jerusalem near the end of his life, his sister was living there, presumably with her family. She may also have gone to Jerusalem for an education, although that is much less likely since women usually did not get a formal education in those days. She probably was married to a Jew who chose to live in Jerusalem for some reason. It's also possible that Paul's nephew was in Jerusalem for an education while his family lived elsewhere. And of course we know, maybe we could look at that for just a second, Acts 23. The next morning some Jews met together. Here's Paul, remember, was arrested in the temple. He was put in prison, held overnight. The next morning, some Jews met together and made a plan. They took a vow that they would not eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. There, uh, there were more than 40 who had planned this together. Then they went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn vow not to eat a thing until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the council send word to the Roman commander to bring Paul down to you, pretending that you want to get more accurate information about him but we will be ready to kill him before he ever gets here. But the son of Paul's sister heard about the plot, so he went to the fort and told Paul, and Paul arranged for him to see the commander, and, and thus his life was, was, was preserved. 
Well, Barnabas was also was a Jew, and where'd he come from? Cyprus. 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 And he lived in Jerusalem at that time. He, in fact, he owned proper there, didn't he? Because he sold some of it, gave it to the church. Later, we know that Barnabas moved to Antioch. What do we know about Antioch? First place uh, church was called Christian. That's the first place where, where believers. believers were called Christians. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire of those days. There was Rome first, and then there was Antioch, and there was Alexandria down in Egypt, and then there was Antioch in Syria. Um, and it was from there that he went, when he saw what was happening there, we'll get to the story later, he went to Tarsus, which is not too far away, and said, Paul, we need you over here at Antioch. The, the gospel, I mean, the gospel is spreading like wildfire. Fire. Um, and we know later that Paul and Barnabas became the first ordained missionaries. So, just a thought question now. Do you think these Hellenistic Jews would be a little bit more receptive to Gentiles becoming Christians than were the Palestinian Jews? It depends on how they were treated by the Gentiles they le lived amongst. Yeah. Um, but, but those Hellenistic Jews basically lived in a, uh, in a mixed culture mm -hmm. and an integrated culture and probably, probably were less bigoted, don't you think? Well, I mean, the kids would have grown up, certainly I would think, playing with Gentiles and getting used to and speaking, people who spoke other languages. They must have felt a little bit less, you know, barriers between them and, and these other peoples. Well, we need to remember something else which is not usually mentioned. Did you know there was an, a, a Roman amphitheater and a Ro Roman horse racing track located just a short distance from the temple in Jerusalem in Jesus' day? Never mentioned in, in the Gospels or any, any, anything at all. That was a part of any major city had to be a part of a major city if you were in the Roman Empire. There it was. If you go look at the models of Jerusalem from Jesus' day, there it is. You can see it. Well, there were a lot of people, including many of the Sadducees, who felt like, why are we trying to fight the Roman government like the Pharisees are all the time? The Pharisees said, we need to stick strictly and tightly to our Jewish heritage. We need to be very faithful. That's the only way God's going to bless us. And the Sadducees are saying, we don't have to be these hardened, dyed Jews. We can, we can sort of integrate with the rest of the world. And, and the Sadducees, many of them, felt like we would be better off if we just sort of integrated into the Roman Empire and spoke Greek and sort of made ourselves at home. So with that background, we need to come to Acts 6 and realize that a, a misunderstanding had arisen between the Greek-speaking Jews and the Aramaic-speaking Jews of Palestine. The question was about whether or not the widows of the two groups were being treated fairly. Fred, I think you have something about that. Yes, from Acts of the Apostles, page 88. <clears throat> the cause of complaint was an alleged neglect of the Greek widows in the daily distribution of assistance. <clears throat> Any inequality would have been contrary to the spirit of the gospel, yet Satan had succeeded in arousing suspicion. Prompt measures now must be taken to remove all occasions for dissatisfaction, lest the enemy triumph in his effort to bring about a division among the believers. Wow. So what are we going to do? We don't know exactly. We, know, we have this three and a half year period from the death of Jesus to the stoning of Stephen. And somewhere during that three and a half years, and we don't know at what point in, during that time um, that uh, these people were chosen, these men were chosen. How many were chosen? Seven. And what was their work? Wait. Uh, Take care of those in need. Okay. Organize it. The, the more traditional translations sometimes say serving tables. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it's interesting to note, let me just give you a little more background. The word talking about what the apostles were doing 
and the word that talks about what they were doing is exactly has exactly the same root so one one group was ministering through the word another was ministering by caring for tables well what does it mean by caring for tables and and imagine you've got a group now of more than 5,000 people you're taking care of and there's seven of you this is not this is not just a you know a simple job and how would you do that without having some kind of an official organization I mean you can see how easy it would be for some misunderstandings to develop would this be, but the widows would have been a smaller group of that yeah 5, of course it wouldn't have been the whole five no 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 of course yeah but People died at a fairly young age in those days, so there were probably more windows, more widows, uh, proportionally than there would be in our day. Well, from what we know, there were seven of these men chosen. All of them had either Greek or Latin names. None of them had Aramaic or Hebrew names. Whether that's significant or not, it's quite possible that, like Paul, Saul, who later became Paul, some of them may have had double names. And we always use the Greek word for Jesus mm -hmm. instead of Yeshua. The, the Yeshua, the yeah. Hebrew. So you don't well, know if they transliterated all these other names too or something. Look at uh, the first few verses of Acts 6. Sometime later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. That would be the Aramaic-speaking Jews. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds. So, the twelve apostles called the whole group of believers together and said, and now where would you, did they meet in the temple court? I mean, where would you meet 5,000 people in a city of Jerusalem with little narrow streets and tiny little houses? Anyway, they said it's not right for us to neglect the preaching of God's word in order to handle finances. So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and the work of preaching. So that was their ministry. The whole group was pleased with Apostles' proposal, the apostles proposal. so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, Nicholas a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier been converted to Judaism. The group presented them to the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. We've already looked at that. So what happened next? Well, let's, um, let's, let's just look at that term serving tables for a moment. I'm going to I'm going to take you back to look at a little bit of detail in Greek. This is uh, 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 some words from the Complete Word Study Dictionary of the New Testament. The word of serving tables, the word for table is trapeza. It comes from four, uh, the number tetra four and peza, which is a table. So it's a four square table, something like this. So generally speaking, it was a place where you set your food on and where you could take your meals. But then it could have some, it came to have additional meanings. Like we would say, set the table. We're not really talking about doing something to the table. We're talking about what? We're talking about putting food out on the table, aren't we? So you, we can see how words can sort of come to had, have extra meanings. So specifically, in those days, tables were associated with money changers. A broker's bench or a counter at which he sat in the market or public place, for example, in the outer court of the temple, and we know about what happened there. Jesus turned those tables over, didn't he? So a, a, a sitter at tables or a, a person who spread a table was someone who dealt with the finances. Generally, a broker's office or bank where money is deposited and loaned out, the word is used with this meaning in Greek in, Greek in Acts 6-2, used metronymically for serving. And therefore, a trapezitis, or as a banker, a money changer, a broker. So you see how tables come to have all sorts of meanings based on what it gets associated with. So these seven men were not just, you know, passing out the food. What else were they doing? They were taking care of all the finances. I mean, th think of people who are selling property and bringing all their money to the to somebody. Somebody's got to take care of that. 
And these seven men apparently were doing that. So, moving on anyway. Do we have any issues facing in the church today that might lead to dissension? No. <laughs> Never, right? Never. <laughs> what can be done to rectify some of those pop problems today? Humble ourselves in God's presence to be directed by Him in, in however we should proceed. I see, but my computer is uh, giving me a little problem here, but we'll see if we can manage. Although, as a general rule, the Sadducees and Pharisees were the major opponents to the spread of the gospel, in Judea and Galilee, obviously, a number of them had been converted. That Christianity was truth to them, and they chose to join the disciples. Some of them became leaders among the believers. Paul is an obvious example. Why do you think it took three and a half years before Christian, the Christian church began to spread out from Jerusalem? Well, there was, uh, Jesus preached for three and a half years, mm -hmm. and towards the end, he, uh, instead of just, there were rebukes and things that he did towards mm -hmm. the end. And you almost see the same uh, giving them one more chance to respond another three and a half years. Um, until, of course, stoning of Stephen, and we see that and as we, a distinct. We can uh, pick up the stoning, the story of Stephen, found in Acts 6, 8 to 15. Let's just touch that really quickly. Stephen, a man richly blessed by God and full of power, and performed, full of power, performed great miracles and wonders among the people. So now it looks like these 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 deacons now are performing miracles. Okay, how many of you have served as deacons at some time in the past? Which one of you perform miracles? Hmm, None of us would anyway, because it's all God's work. <laughs> yeah, right. We're falling, we're falling down on the job here, friends. <laughs> but he was opposed by some men who were members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, which included Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. Hmm. Where is Cyrene and Alexandria? North Africa. North Africa. There, they and other Jews from the provinces of Cilicia and Asia started arguing with Stephen. Where is Cilicia in Asia? South Asia, Turkey. Uh, Turkey. Yeah. And where did Paul come from? Cilicia. Cilicia. Mm -hmm. Do you suppose he was there when Peter started, pray I mean, when, when Stephen started arguing with the people there? But the Spirit gave Stephen such wisdom that when he spoke, they could not refute him. So they bribed some men to, and now we, you know, the whole rest of the story. They, he was taken before the Sanhedrin and tried, and what happened? What do we know about his sermon? Loaded with a lot of good material. Mm -hmm. Persuasive, for sure. <laughs> he was, I mean, he gave a sermon that nobody could argue with until it got down near the end, right? Very powerful sermon. He knew, he knew Hebrew history backward and forward, didn't he? He even mentioned some things from the history of the Old Testament that we don't know. Right. We don't have, let me put it this way, that we don't have in the Old Testament. So we fill in some details of the Old Testament story from what he said. Now, did he have access to some documents that we don't have access to today? Maybe so. Well, his arguments in favor of Christianity were so powerful that no one could answer him. In order to understand the charges raised against Stephen, we need to understand that according to Jewish tradition, there are three pillars upon which all matters rested. These are the three most important things, and everything of any significance is related to these three. The law, and that would, ref that would involve what? Particularly the five books of Moses, but the whole Old Testament. The temple service and good works. So if you're a good Jew, those are the three things that really mattered. So how did Stephen get himself into trouble with the Sanhedrin in his speech? Well, you go back to... Uh, uh Acts 7, about mm -hmm. 42, because he yeah. gave this history of uh, what, the children of Israel. Yeah. But we go to Jeremiah 7, 22, and it says, I did not give them instructions regarding sacrifices and burnt offerings. Yet we, uh, at least I've been led to believe or it, that through the wilderness experience of 40 years in the wilderness, that they were offering sacrifices to God. Mm -hmm. Well, you get, you get to uh, Amos 5, 25, and 26, 
No, they, they were offering sacrifices to the, to the heathen deities. And lo and behold, um, in starting at verse 42 of chapter 7, Paul, or excuse me, Stephen, Stephen. says the very same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? This idea that they were offering sacrifices to, to God through the wilderness is, is bogus. Well, they were, they were particularly upset by the fact that he said this temple, which they thought was an absolutely essential part of their religion, is going to be gone someday. In fact, God, this isn't, isn't his main ho house. His home is in heaven. Huh? What are you talking about? That's heresy. Well, there's no doubt that the accusations against Stephen were largely fabricated. But as in the case of Jesus himself, and you, you know about Mark and John 2, verse 19, Stephen's speech against the temple as it was received by the Sanhedrin revealed that he had a better understanding of the future of the Jewish nation than they did. Did Stephen's speech indicate that he understood that the temple would soon be destroyed? Well, that's one way to understand it. Clearly, Stephen had adopted a new paradigm. Oh dear, what is a new paradigm? Way of looking at things. Yes. <clears throat> An entire whole new way of thinking perspective. about things. New mindset. Most people are uncomfortable yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, he was, he, was, he was sort of working his way out of the standard Jewish understanding of everything. <laughs> Why is it so much harder to give up an old idea that you thought was right for so long than it is to just accept something new that you can just add to your current collection? You have to think. Thinking is hard work. Dear for a lot of me, people. you have to think? Well, well and it's, a lot of those old ideas are tied to people who taught you, and, you know, there's yeah. sociological and uh, all, all, all kinds of yeah. things that tug against that. And you yeah. develop this sense of. The paradigm of yeah. how you, you things feel work like, together. Yeah, you feel like you have a, a nice world here and you've got it all figured out and it all relates to all its parts and someone says, tear out that piece. I mean, it's like, you know, setting a domino off, you know, and, and pretty soon you're not sure what you believe. It's pretty interesting to think that uh, he's still talking about the fathers who had maintained the paradigm of the Egyptians. That was 1,500 years before that yeah. time, yeah. <laughs> in verse yeah. 39. Yeah. Well, look at this, this sequence there, starting with verse 44 in, in Acts 7. Our ancestors had the tent of God's presence with them in the desert. It had been made as God had told Moses to make it according to the pattern that Moses had been shown. Later on, an, our ancestors who received the tent from their fathers carried it with them when they went with Joshua and took over the land from the nations that God drove out as they were advanced. And it stayed there until the time of David. He won God's favor and asked God to allow him to provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built him a house. But the Most High God does not live in houses built by human hands. And all of a sudden, all the red flags are going up. As the prophet says, and he says, I'm quoting to you right out of the Old Testament, Isaiah. What is that? Isaiah um, 66, 1 and 2. Yeah. Heaven is my throne, says the Lord, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? Where is the place for me to live in? Did not I myself make all these things? And so forth. Okay. House, and so... <clears throat> Stephen recognized that the red flags were going up, and he knew when he spoke against the temple, they would be, they would be the devil to pay. How stubborn you are, Stephen went on to say. Now he's talking to the Sanhedrin. How heathen your hearts, how deaf you are to God's message. You are just like your ancestors. You too have always resisted the Holy Spirit. And of course he goes on in his, in his speech. Well, <clears throat> He, of course, was talking about the speech that was there in those days. Stephen realized he was making his audience angry, so he rushed to the conclusion of his sermon, comparing the current Sanhedrin to those who had killed the prophets in the times of the Old Testament. By raising his voice and speaking out against the sins of the current generation, Stephen had taken up the role of a prophet. The prophets, is all they do is speak against the leadership? Sometimes it seems like that, doesn't it? Stephen realized that his life would not last much longer. When necessary, are we willing to stand up for the truth even in the face of fierce opposition? 
Speaking for God as a prophet, Stephen went on to speak the words in Acts 7, 55 and 56. Notice Ellen White's comments. I guess I should read those verses. Give me just a second here. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw God's glory and Jesus standing at the right-hand side of God. Look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man, that's a human being, standing at the right-hand side of God. With a loud voice, the with a loud cry, the members of the council covered their ears with their hand. Then they all rushed at him at once and so forth, taking him out to stone him to death. And Dwayne, I think you have... Gordon a, first. Gordon first? Okay. From Acts of the Apostles, page 100. When Stephen reached this point, there was a tumult among the people. When he connected Christ with the prophecies and spoke as he did of the temple, the priest pretending to be, an, to be horror-stricken, rent his robe. To Stephen, this act was a signal that his voice would soon be silenced forever. He saw the restraint that met his words and knew that he was giving his last testimony. Although in the midst of his sermon, he abruptly concluded it. Suddenly, breaking away from the train of history that he was following and turning upon his infuriated judges, he cried, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the Just One, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers? who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it? Wow, that's incredible. I mean, you know, here you are, they think they're judging you, and he's just turning the tables on them and really just laying it on them, isn't it? And Duane, I think you have the next paragraph or two, is that right? Yeah. Yes. At this point, priests and rulers were beside themselves with anger, acting more like beasts of prey than human beings, they rushed upon Stephen, gnashing their teeth. In the cruel faces about him, the prisoner read his fate. But he did not waver. For him, the fear of death was gone. For him, the enraged priests and the excited mob had no terror. The scene before him faded from his vision. To him, the gates of heaven were ajar. And, looking in, he saw the glory of the courts of God and Christ as if just risen from his throne, standing ready to sustain his servant. In words of triumph, Stephen exclaimed, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. As he described the glorious scene upon which his eyes were gazing, it was more than his persecutors could endure, stopping their ears that they might not hear his words and uttering loud cries, they ran furiously upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Myra? No legal sentence had been passed upon Stephen, but the Roman authorities were bribed by large sums of money to make no investigation into this case, into the case. Acts of the Apostles, 100, paragraph 1 to 101, paragraph 2. So this is something that I used to wonder about when I was younger. How do they get, they couldn't, they're not allowed to kill Jesus without getting the Roman authorities' approval how can they go about killing Stephen? Well, here's the answer. They bribed the Roman authorities with a lot of money. So while Stephen was being judged unfairly by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem... In other words, they said it didn't happen. Huh? Yeah, it didn't happen. Well, so, did this. Go ahead. You'll say that's how the high priests used to keep their position. They paid Herod and the likes of him. Sure. A lot of, the Roman government yeah. paid a lot of money. <coughs> the resurrection of Jesus, you know, these guards should have been killed, but they were, the, the yeah. officials were paid off so that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It was suppressed. So, Jesus, um, looking up to heaven, he saw in vision the day when those very judges, 
would stand before the judgment seat of God. Imagine that. What a change in, <laughs> in the scenario, right? A question I have. Yeah. When reading this event in Acts, it says that Saul was there holding the cloaks. A young Saul. Mm -hmm. Very young. Okay, but it's right after that, he is then going out and making judgments. Did he make a huge jump in his uh, professional uh, pharisaical? We're, we're, we're going to, we're going to, I don't know if we, it's here or later, but we're going to, in one of these lessons, we're going to read a comment from Ellen White that said he was promoted to be a member of the Sanhedrin because of his involvement here with the killing of, of Stephen mm -hmm. and then his persecution of Christians after that. So we need to read the next few verses. Acts 7, the end of Acts 7, starting with verse 57. With a loud cry, the members of the council covered theirs with their hands. We read that a couple times already. They all rushed at him at once, threw him out of the sea, stoned him. The witnesses left their cloaks in the care of a young man named Saul. That's our first mention of Saul. They kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive their spirit, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember this sin against them. He said this and died, and Saul approved of his murder. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men buried Stephen, mourning for him with loud cries. I noticed, and I was listening to Acts this afternoon and from the Message Bible, but talking mm -hmm. about how Stephen, when he was up at the end of his sermon and they were getting more and more angry, they could hardly look at his face because he looked like an angel. It yeah. Was, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, incredible as it may seem, the stoning of Stephen led Saul to begin struggling with his own conscience and eventually to become the most outstanding apostle for the Christian church. So why do you think that all of a sudden persecution just exploded? Get them out of the cities, spread them around. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Say more? I think the, they were getting complacent in where they were. They, in, God wanted them to move out, which is mm -hmm. what a lot of them did. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, whatever the reason, it seemed like this triggered things, just like setting um, some kind of powder off in a powder keg and, you know, arrest those Christians, let's get rid of them, you know. From my, <clears throat> from my study of all this, here are Jews who became Christians. When they were Jews, they were willing to bear arms against the Romans. And here are these Christians who are just not willing to do so. Mm -hmm. Who would love people who are not willing to fight for your nation? Yeah. And that's kind of the attitude of the population. Yeah. Well, so Stephen is the first recorded believer following the crucifixion to be killed because of his faith in Jesus. Now, we know that John the Baptist was beheaded, and that was a little different situation. But So John the Baptist had been killed before this, but now following... Well, following the establishment of the Christian church, per se, he's now the first martyr. Whatever the circumstances, the stoning of Stephen ignited a massive persecution against the Christians, Christian believers in and around Jerusalem. From what we can read, it seems that Saul was the leader of that persecution. Uh, look at a couple of passages. Acts 8, verse 3. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the province of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men bur buried Stephen, mourning with him with loud cries. We read that already, but verse 3, But Saul tried to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged out the believers, both men and women, and threw them into jail. Not very friendly, huh? Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, 26, so he's him in his sermon before Agrippa. He's coming back and says, now, this is Paul's description. That is what I did in Jerusalem. I received authority from the chief priests and put many of God's people in prison. And when they were sentenced to death, I also voted against them. 
Many times I had them punished in the synagogues and tried to make them deny their faith. I was so furious with them that I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. And we know there's a story about that coming up. Well, God used evil to produce good. You remember what it says in Romans 8, 28? Look at that verse real quick. Famous verse. We know that, and uh, in the King James says, all things work together for good to those who love God. No, in the earliest manuscripts, it's God is earlier in the verse. It says, we know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purposes. So who makes the good come out of the bad? It's God that does that. It doesn't just come out by itself. It's just some natural law that says that good comes out of evil. The believers were scattered out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And what, ha what did they do on their way when they were scattered out? Look at a few verses. We're not going to read this whole passage, but look at Acts 8, starting with verse 4. The believers who were scattered went everywhere preaching the message. Philip went to the principal city in Samaria and preached the Messiah to the people there. The crowds paid close attention to what Peter said as they listened to him and saw the miracles that he performed. Evil spirits came out from many people with a loud cry, and many paralyzed and lame people were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon lived there who, had for, some time, who for some time had an astounded the Samaritans with his magic. He claimed that he was someone great, and everyone in the city from all classes of society paid close attention to him. He is that power of God known as a great power, they said. They paid this attention to him because for such a long time he had astonished them with his magic. But when they believed Philip's message about the good news of the kingdom of God and about Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself also believed, and after being baptized, he stayed close to Philip and was astounded when he saw the great wonders and miracles that were being performed. So now Philip is performing with the power of the Holy Spirit. What power did Simon have to do his things? Evil spirit. Well, so the rest of the story we know. Uh, <laughs> the, the people in Jerusalem heard about it, and they said, we need to send some people over there and find out what's going on in Samaria. Well, when they arrived, they prayed for the believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit. What do we call that experience? That's the Pentecost, the right? Yeah, yeah, Pentecost. For the Holy Spirit had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So now we have a Pentecost being repeated where? Samaria. Samaria. In Samaria. Simon saw that the Spirit had been given to the believers when the apostles placed their, placed their hands on them. So he offered money to Peter and John and said, Give this power to me too so that anyone I place my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter answered him, May you and your money go to hell for thinking that you can buy God's gift with money. That's a pretty blunt translation. You have no part to share or share in our work because your heart is not right with God's sight. Repent then of this evil plan of yours and pray to the Lord that he will forgive you for thinking such a thing as this. For I see that you are full of bitter envy and are um, a prisoner of sin. And there's Simon tried to repent. We don't know. Hope that story came out good. Well, what happened next? Well, we drop down to verse 26. Mm. Philip. Philip was doing what? After working in, in Samaria for all that time. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get ready and go south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This road is not used nowadays. And I can tell you that just recently, uh, one of the preeminent, uh, she's a woman, preeminent scholars or archaeologists from America has dug, a spot, dug up a spot on that rolled road that she thinks is the place where the eunuch was actually baptized. Mm -hmm. So we'll wait to see if we hear more about that. This Ethiopian eunuch, now an Ethiopian eunuch who was an important official in charge of the treasury of the Queen of Ethiopia was on his way home. He had been to Jerusalem to worship God and was going back home in his carriage. So we know that he was what kind of a person? Technically he was called a follower of the way. What does that mean? 
A convert to Judaism. A convert to Judaism. As he rode along, he was reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over to that carriage and stay close to it. Philip ran over and heard him reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. He asked him, do you understand what you're reading? The official replied, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip, Philip to climb up and sit in the carriage with him. So imagine, here's like a prince almost asking you, come on up, sit in the carriage with me. The passage of scripture which he was reading was like, was this, like a sheep that is taken to be slaughtered, like a lamb that makes no sound when its wool is cut off. He did not say a word, and of course that's Isaiah 53 and talking about Jesus. And you can imagine that it was a very appropriate thing for Philip to jump right in there and talk about Jesus. After the baptism, Philip was, and the Ethiopian said, when they got to a certain place where there was water, he said, why can't I go down into the water and be baptized? After the baptism, Philip was carried miraculously to the coastline of the Mediterranean, and he preached in all the cities along the coast all the way back to Caesarea Maritima. And we have a comment about that. The persecution that came upon the church in Jerusalem resulted in giving a, a great impetus to the work of the gospel. Success had attended the ministry of the word in its place, and there was danger that the disciples would linger there too long, unmindful of the Savior's commission to go to all the world. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service, they began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to, who, excuse me, to those who had not heard it, they were in danger of taking, the course, excuse me, taking a course that would lead all to be satisfied with that Excuse me, with what had been accomplished, to scatter his representatives abroad where they could work for others, God permitted persecution to come upon them. Driven from Jerusalem, the believers went everywhere preaching the word. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 105.2. Okay, so what's happened here? When these people were forced, well, threatened with their lives and fled from Jerusalem, they didn't just go somewhere and keep quiet. What did they do? Read the word. Gave the message. What would happen if persecution broke out in places where there's Adventist universities today and things like that? It's yeah, happened. Out of town. <clears throat> it has happened. Mm -hmm. Move out of town, and the question is: Would we be, would we be prepared to do what they did in those days? The question is, do you even have a message? Yeah. That's a place to start. Yeah. What, do you, what do you have that's worth, worth dying over? Yeah. And if you have a message, is it the correct one? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in our churches today, who should be responsible for caring for the flock? Who should be responsible for spreading the gospel? Well, um, in, some, in, in one of our classes last quarter, we read a statement from Bell and White that said, it's a fatal mistake to think that the, the, the pastor is responsible for, the only one responsible for spreading the gospel. A fatal mistake. Who's going to die? The general pastors, that is not their job. Their job is to keep things under wraps and keep them down for at best a dull roar. It, it's, well, it's the, the, what the pastor really ought to be doing is teaching his congregation to get out there and go to work. Yes, yeah, true. And that's teaching really, the right message. Well, yeah. God wants a kingdom of priests. Yeah. And that's their job, is to create more priests. Exodus 19 and Second Peter, right? Yes. When I said First what I said, Peter. I'm talking about the way things actually work and not yeah. the way we're supposed to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, each one of us has our responsibilities, and everyone should be seeking for ways to tell the truth to those around them. This is a work that cannot be left just to the pastors. Will God do need to send persecution to motivate us? Hmm. Now when we say again, God sent persecution, where did the persecution actually come from? From the adversary. And it, from the adversary, from the scribes and Pharisees and the people. Removed his protective care. Yeah. Like with the serp serpents in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. right. It's a persecution that comes to all those who do not agree with the word of Jesus, really. Yeah. So, Lee, we'd like to throw a question out to you there. 
as our audience. What is your own experience in spreading the gospel? Have you had that wonderful ex privilege of bringing someone to the gospel and to the church from among your friends or among people out there in the world? It's a wonderful experience, I can tell you. It has been estimated by some scholars that by the time of Stephen, by the time Stephen was stoned, now this is how, how long after the crucifixion and the Pentecost? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. There were about 20,000 Christian believers living in and around Jerusalem. 20,000. They came from two groups that were already, we already know, the Greek-speaking Jews and the Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking Jews. The suggestion that the disciples presented the Christian group which led to the choosing of those seven deacons was certainly God-inspired. How many of the solutions that we suggest to problems that we have in the church today leads to large increases in membership and growth of the church? Can you think of any examples where a church has arisen in, a problem has arisen in the modern church, someone has come up with a solution that leads to spread of the Gospels. We don't think of a lot of those, do we? There must have been some somewhere. Probably overseas and some of the places where people, well, what people I, are more directly persecuted. What, yeah, what I can say is that without mentioning the names of any countries, there are places in the world today where it's against the law to become a Christian. And guess where the most rapid church growth is taking place? Example of that, would, isn't that India? India, Pakistan. Where they, they, I wasn't going to mention any names. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, yeah, okay. uh, well, we're among, hopefully among friends here. Yeah. <laughs> Those that are not interested are not, are not likely to be tuning in, so. Mm. Well, what do you think Stephen would have been a good one to choose as the th as the twelfth disciple in place of Matthias? Well, Stephen was a, he he sure had his history down and, and his interpretation his well. ability. Uh, yeah, what? his preaching ability. Yeah, and his ability to win arguments. Tremendous. At least to at least to persuade to to, to talk in the name of Jesus. I mean, he's talking, he goes into synagogues and raises Cain, you know. He may have come in later uh, yeah. than Math Math Possibly, yeah. But we have to think that Judas was not chosen by Jesus and yeah. that Matthias was not chosen by Jesus either. Yeah. Paul was. Yeah. Interestingly enough, do, do, oh, I should ask the question now, do we know about what happened to any of the other seven Deacons other than Stephen and Philip? Do we even know their names? Yeah, yeah. Do we know their names. Are they're they're listed. listed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting possibility that some have suggested that the Nicolaitans mentioned in Revelation 2, verses 6 and 14. Let me just read that to you. Revelation 2, verse 6. But this is what you have in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I do. This is one of the messages to the churches in Revelation. Um, and then drought down to verse 14. Uh, if I can find it here real quick. But there are a few things I have against you. There are some among you who follow the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak how to lead the people of Israel into sin by persuading them to eat food they've been offered to idols and to practice sexual immorality. In the same way you have people among you who follow the teaching of the Nicolaitans. What do we know about the teaching of the Nicolaitans? Well, it's real hard to piece that together, but there are scholars who have looked at it and they think that uh, this was the beginnings of the ideas of, of uh, the, the Gnostics. And some people think that maybe this was, these were followers of Nicholas. Nicholas, one of the, one of the um, deacons that was chosen. We, of course, have no proof of that, but that's a possibility. Well, Dr. Luke, himself a Greek, spoke in glowing terms about Stephen. We've already seen some of those places. Where do you think Stephen was during the ministry of Jesus himself? 
What led to him to become a man full of the Holy Spirit, faith, wisdom, grace, and power, also known as a person of prayer, miracles, truth, light, and forgiveness? All those things are mentioned by Dr. Luke. Would he have served as well as one of the, were served well as one of the disciples? Or would he have been rejected by the disciples because he was not an Aramaic speaking to Hebrew? What do you suppose was the result of Philip's travel briefly along the Mediterranean coast and preaching uh, in, in those cities? Could such a brief interaction really produce a significant results? We need to remember that later, Philip and his family, including his four prophetic daughters, lived in Caesarea Maritima. And what was, what was important about Caesarea Maritima? It's where Cornelius lived. Okay, Corn and why did Cornelius live there? He was a centurion, and mm -hmm. I assume he was stationed there. By that was the that was the headquarters for the Roman government of Palestine. Yeah, so here's here's Philip and his four daughters and family working right under the nose of the Romans. Well, the sermon of Stephen and those of Peter and Paul recorded in the book of Acts reveal the fact that when speaking to Jews who were knowledgeable of the history of their nation, they virtually always begin by speaking about some of the ancient patriarchs. And that's an important point. It's, it's when you want to make a, a point with, with an audience, you need to speak about something with which they're familiar before you try to take them to something with which they're not familiar. Do you think God actually allowed the events connected to the stoning of Stephen in order to scatter the believers out of Jerusalem? Well, possibly. Dennis, I think you have a comment there to finish up. The appointment of the seven to take the oversight of special lines of work proved a great blessing to the church. These officers gave careful consideration to individual needs as well as to the general financial interests of the church. And by their prudent management and their godly example, they were an important aid to the fellow officers in binding, them, binding together the various interests of the church into a united whole. Acts of the Apostles 89. So there we have Ellen White confirming the fact that the, they didn't just serve tables. They were a deal with all the finances and so forth like that. By the way, she shows there that she understood the Greek implications behind it. How did she know anything about Greek? Hmm, that's interesting. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our time together. Our kind and loving Father, these powerful lessons have been left for us to study so that we may get some ideas about what you would like us to do even in our day. May we take up our tasks with renewed energy is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.